Welcome to the 25th meeting of the 2018 of the uh, ECCLR committee. Before we mo uh, move to consider the Cr Scottish Crown Estate Bill at stage two, I would like to remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. The committee will now consider the Scottish Crown Estate Bill at stage two. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and her officials. Mike Palmer, Deputy Director of Agriculture of the Crown Estate, Recreational Fisheries and European Division. David Mallon, Head of the Crown Estate Strategy Unit. Laura Begg, Scottish Government Legal Division. And Anna Lee Murphy, Parliamentary Council. We should note that officials are not allowed to speak on the record during these proceedings. Members may find it helpful if we have a reminder of the process. Everyone should have a copy of the bill as introduced, the marshalled list of amendments, which sets out the amendments in the order which they will be disposed of, and the groupings. There will be one debate for each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in the group to speak to and move that amendment and to speak to all the other amendments in the group. I will then call on any other members who have lodged amendments in that group to speak on their amendments, as well as any others in the group but not at that time to move their amendments. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should indicate to me or the clerk. If the Cabinet Secretary has not already spoken on the group, I will invite her to contribute to the debate just before we move to the winding up speech. There might be times when I allow a little bit more flexibility for members to come back on points during a debate. Again, just indicate to me or the clerks. The debate on each group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the first amendment in the group to wind up. Following the debate in the group, I will check whether the member who moved the first amendment in the group wishes to press it to a vote or to withdraw it. If the member wishes to press it, I will put the question on the amendment. If the member wishes to withdraw it, I will check whether any other member objects. If any member objects, the amendment is not withdrawn and the committee must Im immediately move to vote on it. If any member does not wish to move their amendment when it is called, they should say not moved, and they should do so audibly. Any other member present may move such an amendment. However, if no one moves the amendment, it, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Only committee members are allowed to vote. Voting on any division is by a show of hands. It is important that members keep their hands clearly raised until the clerks have recorded the vote. The committee is required to indicate formally that it is considered and agreed to each section of the bill, so I will put a question in each section at the appropriate point. And I hope that's clear to everybody. Right, the question is, first question is, that section one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, right, move on. I call amendment one in the name of the cabinet secretary, grouped with all other amendments as shown in the groupings. I would point out that if amendment eight is agreed to, I cannot call amendment 35 in the group, management of marine assets. I invite the cabinet secretary to move amendment one and speak to all amendments in the group. Um, thank you, convener, and uh, welcome to your uh, new post. Um, the amendments in this group are all of a minor or technical nature. Uh, amendment 1 is a technical amendment which takes account of two new acts, the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Act 2018 and the Islands Scotland Act 2018, which were passed by the Scottish Parliament after the introduction of this bill. The amendment inserts provision to adjust references to Crown Estate Scotland interim management in these two acts as a result of the renaming of Crown Estate Scotland interim management by Section 1 of the bill to Crown Estate Scotland. Amendments 7 and 8 have been lodged in response to parliamentary feedback at Stage 1, and my commitment to ensure that Section 4 is sufficiently clear to give effect to the intention that Scottish Ministers should be not able to direct a manager of an asset to delegate the management function of a Scottish Crown Estate asset to the Scottish Ministers. I am pleased to lodge Amendment 7 to address this matter. It clarifies that the Scottish Ministers, and furthermore that Crown Estate Scotland, are not persons to whom the function of managing a Scottish Crown Estate asset 
may be delegated under Section 4.1. Amendment 8 is a consequential amendment, uh, but uh, as you have pointed out, it would also result in a preemption of Amendment 35. Uh, amendment 19 is a minor drafting amendment. The duty to obtain at least market value for a transfer of ownership or grant of a lease, etc., can be departed on uh, from if the manager is satisfied that the transaction is likely to contribute to the promotion or improvement in Scotland of any of the socio-economic or environmental factors listed in paragraphs A to E of section 11, subsection 2. The inclusion of an or in this list makes it clear that the list is not cumulative and that a transaction may be made for less than market value if any of the listed factors is relevant. There are references to the Crown Estate Transfer Scheme within the Bill. We think that it is neater to provide a definition of the transfer scheme within the interpretation section of the Bill, as has been done with the Crown Estate Scotland Order. This avoids the need to repeat the title of the statutory instrument in full, along with the number, every time the Bill refers to the transfer scheme. Amendment 29, therefore, inserts a definition of Crown Estate Transfer Scheme into Section 43, with Amendments 20, 21 and 23 consequentially removing the full title and number of the Transfer Scheme from Sections 11, 12 and 24. Section 25 of the Bill requires the Scottish Ministers to lay a copy of each annual report prepared by a manager before the Scottish Parliament. The Bill, as originally drafted, prevented Crown Estate Scotland and other managers from publishing their own annual reports until the Scottish Ministers had laid a copy of their report under Section 25. Section 37 of the Bill allows the Scottish Ministers to delegate some of their functions, including the laying of annual reports, to Crown Estate Scotland. To take account of that possibility, these amendments make adjustments to refer instead to managers being prevented from publishing their own annual report until after it has been laid before the Scottish Parliament to reflect that annual reports may be laid before the Scottish Parliament by the Scottish Ministers or by Crown Estate Scotland. This is a very technical bill, um, Convener, and uh, uh, I appreciate that those are very technical amendments. I move Amendment 1. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and to your officials. I simply want to highlight that, although I uh, fully appreciate that um, a gender representation on public boards is already a legal obligation, I'm very pleased to see it um, uh, coming through into this context. Thank you. And Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I'm afraid I may not have fully woken up, uh, so the, the, the question may be a dumb one, uh, but I'd just like confirmation that uh, schedule one, which is the list of bills to which we're just adding by amendment one, is capable of further amendment after the bill is passed uh, by order. Yes. Thank yes. you. No other members have any comments to make? I invite the cabinet secretary to wind up. I don't think there's anything further okay. I can add. Thank you. So the question is that amendment one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the question is that Schedule 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the question is that Section 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Right. I call Amendment 30 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I invite Andy Whiteman to move Amendment 30 and speak to all other members in the group. Uh, thanks very much, um, Convener. Uh, my amendments in this group uh, form two distinct propositions. The first is set out in Amendments 30 and 31, and the second is comprising Amendments 32 and 33, and I'll deal with each in turn. So first, 30 and uh, 31. Uh, the Smith Commission recommended in its uh, report, um, paragraph 33 of its final report, uh, that following the devolution of management of the Crown Estate, responsibility for the management of these assets will be further devolved to local authorities. <clears throat> As drafted, Section 3 gives of the Bill uh, gives authority to ministers to make regulations to transfer these management functions to any person <coughs> mentioned in subsection 2. It remains possible, of course, that ministers may not choose to make regulations 
or may choose to revoke any regulations that are made. In addition, it remains possible that regulations may be drafted in such a way that makes the transfer of management functions unduly onerous and complex. These are all questions to which there is no clear answer, but they are possibilities in the future. The Smith recommendation makes clear, however, that responsibility will be further devolved to local authorities. So Amendment 30 is designed to uphold that cross-party agreement. It provides that the transfer of management functions in relation to the foreshore is a statutory right which regulations must be designed to facilitate, and Amendment 31 makes that clear. So why only uh, the foreshore? Quite simply because it's one of the distinctive ancient Crown property rights. Um, the ownership by the Crown is regarded by the Scottish Law Commission as a patrimonial right derived from the Crown prerogative that's nowhere defined in statute, but is merely, as the Commission notes, the predominant modern theory. It plays a distinct and critical role in coastal management, a function that more widely falls into the realm of local authorities. And its history, as set out in a recent book by John McCaskill, published by Edinburgh University Press, is one, which the public interest, is one in which the public interest in the foreshore has frequently been compromised by the long-standing requirement to, amongst other things, obtain best consideration from any sale or lease. Convener, Amendment 30 is designed to fulfil the recommendations of the Smith Commission to provide that the transfer of management functions is as of right and not as currently drafted in the gift of ministers. If agreed, I will be proposing to bring forward subsequent amendments at stage three to the effect that any transfer of functions to local authorities relating to the foreshore will be exempt from the direction-making powers under section four and to exempt it from certain functions imposed by other sections in the bill, but that's for the future. Local authorities should be free to manage the foreshore in the manner best judged by them to fulfil their own responsibilities and their own electorate. So that's amendments 30 and 31. Convener, I now turn to the second set of amendments in my name, uh, 32 to 36, of which 32 and 33 are the substantive ones and 34 to 36 uh, are consequential. Amendments 32 and 33 achieve the same purpose as each other. The first in relation to the seabed and the second in relation to the foreshore. Uh, the history of management of the foreshore and the seabed in and around Scotland's coasts has been very often one of conflict between the aspirations of local communities, local authorities and harbour authorities on the one hand, and the Crown Estate Commissioners uh, on the other. And devolution, I hope, should change this. Of Scotland's 375 harbours and ports, 241 are owned and managed by local authorities, 24 by other public authorities, including Scottish ministers, and 33 are trust ports. They all operate under a statutory framework intended to secure the public interest and are critical to Scotland's marine uh, economy. Schedule 5 of the Crown Estate Transfer Scheme 2017 highlights the role of Crown land to these harbours, as it amends a very, very large number of statutes, including the Pitt and Weem Harbour Order Confirmation Act of 1992, the Lerwick Harbour Act 94, Confirmation Orders for the Burnery Causeway, the Macduff Harbour Revision Order 1999, and the Scottish Natural Heritage Rum Empowerment Order 1999. The committee recommended in its stage one report that the bill should be amended to ensure that the seabed cannot be sold. In section 10 of the bill, uh, in section 10, the bill provides that this is possible with the consent of Scottish ministers, and in any event, a lease of up to 150 years is permitted <coughs> under section 14. Scotland's ports and harbours are routinely and actively engaged in development activity by way of new slips, piers, harbour walls, and breakwaters that involve securing legal agreements with the Crown over the seabed and, less frequently, the foreshore. Amendments 32 and 33 are designed to make it obligatory that Section 3 regulations transfer the management of the seabed and the foreshore, provided that it is in the public interest to do so. Now, I was minded, convener, to frame this provision in relationship to ownership of the foreshore and seabed, but given that the bill continues to permit the alienation of the seabed and leases of up to 150 years, and no amendments have been lodged to deliver on the committee's recommendation at stage one, I framed it in such a way that that statutory right is created for the transfer of management functions only. My view, however, is that such a scheme should include the circumstances in which ownership would also be transferred, given that lenders, for example, uh, a Norwegian bank uh, willing to lend £10 million to Lerwick Harbour Authority um, may not be content with a security that rests on mere management or indeed a long lease. So if the Minister is minded to agree with the principle underlying these amendments as they stand, I'd be keen to explore how this could be extended to cover cases where the port or harbour requires ownership of the seabed or foreshore to be transferred. I move amendments 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35 and 36 in my name. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr Whitman.
I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 25 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, the Bill includes powers for the Scottish Ministers to devolve management responsibilities in respect of Scottish Crown Estate assets and opens up the possibility for local authorities and community organisations to take on the management of assets in their areas. This is a key principle of the Bill that was supported by the, by the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee following their consideration at Stage 1. So um, I wish to respond to Andy Whiteman's amendments before I go on to uh, the Government Amendment. Because Amendment 30 um, cuts right across the proposal that a community organisation could take on management of an area of the foreshore, as it would restrict those who could take on that management function to local authorities. Amendments 31 and 32 seek to restrict the power to make transfer regu regulations as they seek to compel Scottish ministers to make regulations under section 3, subsection 1, transferring the function of managing assets relating to the seabed to a local authority or a trust port if it is in the public interest to do so. This, however, fails to take into account that not all local authorities may have the desire to take on the management of an asset. Also, it fails to give due weight that another person, such as a community organisation, may in fact be better placed and could demonstrate wider public benefits in managing such an asset. As we speak, Crown Estate Scotland Interim Management is considering applications for pilots of local asset management. The scheme will test different approaches to local management and inform how aspects of the bill may be best implemented. The scheme is a clear indicator of community interest in management and over half of the 13 applications are from organisations that are not councils or trust ports. Amendments 31 and 32 would effectively prevent community organisations from becoming managers of these assets and, as I indicated, cut right across the pilot scheme process and a key provision of the Bill. It's my clear intention to use the new powers in the Bill to enable further devolution of management on a case-by-case -case basis. This will allow decisions to be taken carefully while recognising that a one-size-fits-all approach is simply not suited to such a diverse range of assets. It is not clear in Amendment 32 who would determine whether the transfer would be in the public interest, nor does the amendment define the seabed. The Bill already establishes a process for the transfer by regulations and it is unclear how the consultation obligation provided for in the amendment would work in this context. Amendment 32 would in particular result in a more fragmented distribution of leasing responsibilities out to 200 nautical miles, and representatives of offshore activities have expressed concerns about councils taking on seabed leasing functions currently managed at the national level. There's an overlap between Amendments 32 on the seabed and Amendment 33, which relates to the foreshore, as typically the seabed is understood to also include the foreshore. There is not a definition of foreshore contained within Amendment 33. And these amendments will remove ministers' discretion regarding the management of the seabed and foreshore. I also consider Amendments 34, 35 and 36 to be unnecessary, as provisions in the Bill under Section 6 subsection 1 uh, sub subsection B could be used to enable one or more trust ports to be eligible to become a manager if they were designated by the Scottish ministers as a community organisation. There are also potential definitional difficulties associated with the amendments uh, with amendments 34, 35 and 36 as they only add trust ports to the list of eligible delegates and transferees. There are at present other types of port that currently exercise public functions and could therefore potentially seek to manage Scottish Crown assets, Scottish Crown estate assets. And for these reasons, I would urge Mr Whiteman not to press amendments 30 to 36. If Mr Whiteman wishes to contact me to discuss his concerns about the ability particularly for a trust port to be a manager, I would be happy to meet with him to discuss this matter in advance of stage three. In relation to the Government Amendment 25, both the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee 
requested the ability of Parliament to scrutinise the content of regulations transferring the management of Scottish Crown Estates by the affirmative procedure if the, if the regulations were transferring the management of an asset of significance or significant value. I recognise that concern and accept that recommendations, the recommendations that a definition of what would constitute significance or significant value in relation to an asset should be set out on the face of the bill and also that the affirmative procedure should apply to regulations which would transfer the management of such an asset. I have reached the conclusion that a transfer of the management of any part of the seabed, except where it is the foreshore, is one of significance or significant value. The potential impact on third parties, such as mariners, is significant, as is the potential or actual financial value and the wider economic and environmental significance of these assets. This amendment ensures that the affirmative procedure will apply to any transfer of management of strategic national infrastructure, such as cables and pipelines, offshore wind, tidal and wave energy, and carbon capture and storage. What constitutes part of the seabed has been defined within the amendment and includes the Scottish marine area, which is that part of the seabed out to the 12 nautical mile limit and the Scottish zone, which lies between the 12 nautical mile limit and the 200 nautical mile limit. The Scottish zone is not owned by the Crown, but international maritime law gives a coastal state the rights in that zone, and these have been vested in the Crown. Marine assets which lie solely within the foreshore area which is the land that lies between the high and low water marks of ordinary spring tides, are not considered to be assets of significance or significant value and will therefore be subject to the negative procedure. Amendment 26 is consequential on Amendment 25. So I urge members to support Amendments 25 and 26 in this group and I also urge Andy Whiteman not to press Amendments 30 to 36. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We have some other members. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, I've got a particular issue I raised, but before I do that, I, I just want to pick up on uh, what Mr Whiteman said about uh, leases and, and whether they can be used uh, as assets for bank borrowing. Um, the, the, the maximum length of a lease, of course, is 175 uh, years after the passage of the Long uh, Leases Act by this Parliament in 2012. Um, uh, he and I worked on that, uh, so we're both quite familiar with that particular act. Uh, but also, uh, banks are much more imaginative in what they'll lend uh, money against and habitually will lend money against long uh, leases, which uh, it, it can, of course, be registered. Indeed, I remember being at a board meeting of the Bank of Scotland where we were discussing lending money uh, against an asset which was two storeys of a building in Manhattan that had not been built, but for which the owner of the building had consent to build and to transfer to someone else, because the maximum in Manhattan is six storeys. Uh, you, there are skyscrapers, but you need to buy the rights from others. So it was an asset, even though it was nothing but clear air with no physical manifestation. So banks are much less worried. But more substantially, um, the, the, the issue I really wanted to raise, um, in particular in sections 32 and 33, uh, was the definition of trust port that Mr Whiteman is using. Um, at 32.1e, in this part, trust port means a harbour authority other than one within subsection 1F below, and then gives a list. And one item on that list is any company having share capital. And Mr Whiteman has told us uh, that we have 33 trust ports. I don't know what they are, uh, but before coming here, I did look at the structure of uh, Aberdeen Harbour, uh, which I think most of us think is a trust port. Uh, but actually, according to Companies House, um, Aberdeen Harbour Limited, there is one share, and it is owned by the Aberdeen Harbour Board. Uh, so therefore the structure is a slightly complex one, because I understand the Aberdeen Harbour Board is not an executive board, but is a non-executive board, and therefore the powers and assets would be attributable to the company that has a shareholding. 
And so therefore, the definition uh, that Mr. Whiteman has used, and I, 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 I'm, I'm absolutely open that the research on this may not be entirely complete, but I think uh, what I have done uh, indicates that uh, the particular definition that's being used may introduce difficulties and exclude some ports that we would imagine are trust ports. And I suspect that's not Mr Whiteman's uh, intention. Uh, the construction at 1E and 1EF in 32 is repeated at 1E and 1EF uh, in 33 is the same. And of course, uh, the further uh, references to trust ports uh, depend on the definition of the trust port at 1E uh, and uh, uh, 1F. Uh, Although I'm not entirely clear uh, in 34, 35, 36, where the references to trust port, uh, exactly what definition is being used for them, because the definition used at 32.1e is restrictive to in this part, uh, but also 33.1e is in this part. Now, I know they're identical, but there is, I think just in drafting terms, there's a little bit of uh, confusion around that. It may, of course, be that it's only in my mind, um, and uh, I will wait to see what we hear. Convener. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Um, these are complex issues, I, and I want to preface my short remarks by um, saying that where I agree with Andy Whiteman and where our committee and I know the Scottish Government agree is that, um, that with the Smith Commission statement that there should be further devolution, and that is an important marker for, for these amendments. Um, I've listened to the debate, and to be open about it, when I came in, I thought, yes, now, I'm listening very carefully, and I do think it's very important that um, these issues have a more robust way of being devolved to local authorities. But in view of what the Cabinet Secretary has said in relation to Amendment 30, I, I think at this stage um, it is important that we recall our other deliberations in committee, and also it happens to be that it's also my my role as a spokesperson for land reform, that the devolution to communities is also very vital. So, and, and I wouldn't want it to affect that in any way. So um, I'm not saying that I understand all the complexities of this issue in the way that others appear to, and I'm sure do, but I would at this stage um, ask um, uh, <coughs> Andy Whiteman to consider uh, not pressing um, the Amendment 30 and associated amendments, especially in view of the Cabinet Secretary offering to have further discussion. Um, and, and I do think there's an important issue that I just want to quickly highlight, that um, the, I'm, I'm glad that it is recognised that um, tenant farmers in, in rural estates have a concern about um, the devolution to local authorities. And I know that this amendment doesn't cover that, but I think it's important that 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 is pointed out. Um, in terms of um, the Amendment uh, 32, um, I I'm, again was um, we, in discussion with my colleague Alec Rowley as well. We had thought that we would be voting yes. I would again ask um, Andy Whiteman to consider um, uh, holding back at this stage in view of the offer of the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I do think it is very important, this amendment, uh, because of the, the possibilities for um, the, the ports and harbours and um, uh, uh, the trust ports to, and local authority, indeed, owned uh, ports and harbours to be able to um, have the powers to do what they want to do without being radically held up. Um, which I understand is one of the one of the issues. Um, uh, on the other hand, I think from hearing about the sub, the follow-on amendments as well that um, these issues will need further discussion and refining, which is perhaps the purpose of, of stage two. Um, and I would also like to put, support the cabinet secretary's um, amendment 25, and I think the division between affirmative and negative is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Richard Lyle. Thank you, can you hear that? Anyone who knows Andy Whiteman knows that he is a champion of community ownership. But I agree with my colleagues. If we pass these amendments, I think on the foreshore, to my mind, this will deny community or, uh, organisations the opportunity of managing the foreshore. And I don't believe Andy Whiteman or the amendment he wants to press goes to the heart of really what he wants to see. So I would ask him to withdraw it and take up the offer. 
to uh, have the future discussions with the Cabinet Secretary in regard to the points that he wants to make. Thank you. And John Scott. Um, similar to essentially what Richard Lyle and Claudia Beamish have said, I have some sympathy with Andy Whiteman's um, idea of further devolution and growing the trust ports, but it does appear from what the Cabinet Secretary has said that it is incomplete in achieving um, probably the, the ambitions that he is seeking to achieve. I, I think he should accept the Cabinet Secretary's offer and withdraw Amendment 35 and 36 and <clears throat> work to bringing forward an amendment um, perhaps at, at stage three. Um, I welcome to Amendment 25, um, which um, introduces the affirmative procedure, I think, and I agree with Claudia Bremish that the balance is now correct. Thank you. Thank you. And no other members want to make any points. I'll invite Andy Whiteman to wind up and if you could press or withdraw your amendment 30 at that point. Uh, thank you, convener. Cabinet Secretary. If I could just say something before that, because I thought it might be helpful for the committee to hear who it is that has expressed an interest so far, the 13 applications that are already in, if, if members would find that helpful. Yes. yes. Um, Clyde Fisherman's Association and Clyde Fisherman's Trust, the Western Isles Council, Community Inshore Fisheries Alliance, Findhorn Village Conservation Company, 4th District Salmon Fisheries Board, Gulson Estate Trust, Loch Goyle Moorings Association and Loch Goyle Jetties Trust, Malay Harbour Authority, Orkney Islands Council, Port Gordon Community Harbour Association, Shetland Islands Council, St Abs and yeah. Eyemouth Voluntary Marine Reserve and Tay and Arn Trust. Of that, there are only three local authorities expressing an interest thus far, and only one on the list, Malek Harbour Authority, is a trust port. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Andy Whiteman, would you like to sum up and press or withdraw your Amendment 30? Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and thanks for the various contributions uh, to the debate on this um, section. A number of members raised um, technical drafting points. Um, I think that's to be expected at stage two. Um, I'm interested in testing the substance, though, of the propositions. Um, I would just remind members that the Smith Commission <coughs> recommendation wasn't about should or would, it was about will. And the, um, there's nothing, I, I take the points about uh, community bodies, uh, but there's nothing to prevent local authorities um, from further delegating or devolving their own, uh, delegating rather, their own responsibilities in that regard to, to, to community bodies. And I've never taken the view um, that it should be ministers who determine these things. I've never taken the view that it should be ministers who determine community right to buy applications. I've always thought that should be local authorities. I think ministers have far too much uh, discretion and control uh, in this area. So this amendment 30, 30 and 31 is designed to fulfil the Smith Commission recommendation in its spirit, which, uh, in, or, in other words, to provide a statutory right to implement the Smith Commission recommendation that these regulations will be used in order to fulfil that recommendation, that as of right, they have that right to have that uh, managed. Um, trust ports, I, uh, and just on that point, there, there is no obligation placed on local authorities, either as the bill stands or indeed under my amendment. There's no obligation to take on board these management functions, no obligation whatsoever. Um, so those that don't wish to have no need to. On, on trust ports, this is very important. I, I do not agree with the Cabinet Secretary that trust ports are community bodies to be um, added to by order under Section 6. Trust ports are established in the 19th century by statute. Uh, they're statutory bodies with a, with a well-understood statutory uh, framework. Uh, and I do think um, that a scheme um, or some ability for them to, to have particular rights to have either management functions or indeed the ownership of the seabed transferred to them is an important one. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's offer to further discuss that. For the record, I'm, I'm not recommending, I'm not proposing in this amendment that any rights to the, to the seabed be um, granted out with the normal area of, of operations of a port, uh, which already, again, defined in statute. These lines are on maps. All Ports and harbours have lines on maps over which their existing authority uh, to dredge and set up moorings and all the rest of it uh, is, defi is defined. Uh, just to conclude, convener, um,
given the range of views that have been expressed on these amendments and given the Cabinet Secretary's uh, willingness to sit down and talk about the issues I've raised, I um, will not be pressing um, amendments 30 and others in my name in this group. Thank you. Okay. So Andy Whiteman seeks to withdraw amendment 30. Does any member object? Nope. The amendment 30 is withdrawn. Okay. I call Amendment 31 in the name of Andy Whiteman. Already debated with Amendment 30. I invite Andy Whiteman to move or not move. I not move. Okay. I call Amendment 32 in the name of Andy Whiteman. <coughs> Already debated with Amendment 30. I invite Andy Whiteman to move or not move. Not move. Okay. And move on to Amendment 33. I call Amendment 33 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 30. I invite Andy Whiteman to move or not move. Not move. Okay. I call Amendment 34 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 30. I invite Andy Whiteman to move or not move. Not move. Call Amendment 2 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with Amendment 16. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 2 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Scottish public authorities are one of the categories of those persons who are eligible to become a manager of a Scottish Crown Estate asset. This, the Bill does not define what a Scottish public authority was and relies on the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010 definition. Using this definition potentially includes cross-border public authorities, of which there are only two, the Scottish Traffic Commissioner and Citizens Advice Scotland, neither of which it would be expected to become a manager. The intention is not to transfer the function of managing Scottish Crown Estate assets to any cross-border public authority, which is a Scottish public authority that is exercising functions only in or as regards Scotland. Amendments 2 and 16 therefore provide that the references to transfer or delegation of functions to Scottish public authorities are restricted to those public authorities with mixed functions or no reserved functions within the meaning of the Scotland Act 1998. This avoids any suggestion that Scottish ministers intend to transfer management functions to cross-border public authorities, and I encourage members to support these amendments. Thank you. Any other members wish to speak on this? No. I will invite the Cabinet Secretary to sum up, but I don't think there's any need. No? Uh, I don't think there's any no. uh, need. I move Amendment 2. Okay. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Okay. I call Amendment 3 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with Amendments 4 and 6. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 3 and speak to all amendments in the group. Convener, this set of Scottish Government amendments has been lodged as we identified a need to ensure that the relevant provisions of the Bill permit the Scottish Ministers to impose requirements on Scottish Crown Estate asset managers regarding the treatment of records. Part 1 of the Public Records Scotland Act 2011 already places obligations on the majority of Scottish public bodies in respect of the management of public records, such as the keeping, securing and preservation of such records. These obligations would apply to a number of bodies who may become Scottish Crown Estate asset managers, including local authorities, Crown Estate Scotland and the Scottish Ministers. This legislation does not, however, apply to community organisations or potentially some other public authorities. As this would create a gap in the management of some records relating to management of some Scottish Crown Estate assets, depending on who manages them, I have concluded that there should be a provision in the Bill to permit the Scottish Ministers to impose similar requirements on other Scottish Crown Estate Managers not caught by the 2011 Act regarding the management of records. Amendments 3, 4 and 6 amend the Bill to make it clear that Scottish Ministers, when making regulations under Section 3, Subsection 1, Subsection, subsection A, 
may make provisions about the management of records relating to the exercise of the transferee's functions as a manager. A new section 3, subsection 7, provides a definition of management of records confirming that keeping, storing, securing, archiving, preservation, destruction or other disposal are all matters included in the power to make provision about the management of records and I encourage members to support them. I move Amendment 3. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. No one's indicated that they wish to speak in this, so we'll go to the question. The, amendment is, the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 4 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 3. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 4 formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 5 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group of its own. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 5. Convener, Section 3, Subsection 4 of the Bill, as introduced, contained a power to make regulations to transfer the management of an asset or any associated rights or liabilities which had been transferred to a community organisation by way of regulation in the event that community organisations cease to exist to another person who is eligible to become a manager of a Scottish Crown Estate asset. There is, however, also the possibility that a manager may dispose of any such asset or acquire new rights and liabilities during the intervening period, or that a community organisation may still be responsible for rights and liabilities relating to former assets when it ceases to exist. To take into account these possible scenarios, this amendment has the effect of adjusting section 3, subsection 4a, to allow transfer regulations to make provision where a community organisation ceases to exist to transfer the function of managing any Scottish Crown Estate asset and any right or liability that the manager may have in relation to a Scottish Crown Estate asset or a former Scottish Crown Estate asset to another eligible manager. I move Amendment 5. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Call Amendment 6 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 3. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Moved. Amendment 6. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 6 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Move on to Section 4. Call Amendment 7 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 1. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 8 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already Moved. debated. Thank you. I would remind members that if Amendment 8 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 35. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, Group with amendments as shown in the groupings. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 9 and speak to all amendments in the group. Convener, this set of Scottish Government amendments has been lodged in response to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and Environment, Cl Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommendations at Stage 1. Amendment 9 addresses a desire to strengthen engagement with potential asset managers and other interested parties as part of the delegation process. Sections 3 and 4 of the Bill confer on the Scottish Ministers the ability, by way of two distinct methods, by which the management function of Scottish Crown Estate assets can be passed to another person, uh, um, that is, transfer and delegation. In respect of the ability to transfer management functions, Section 3, subsection 5, places a duty on Scottish ministers to consult with certain interested persons prior to making regulations transferring the function of managing a Scottish Crown Estate asset. Amendment 9 places a duty on the Scottish ministers to carry out a similar consultation process prior to giving a direction requiring the delegation of management functions. This will facilitate increased engagement with relevant parties, which we consider to be of particular benefit as delegation of a management function is likely to be a method by which community organisations take on management functions. The amendment ensures stakeholders are involved in the process, that the views and opinions of potential managers are heard, 
and that they have a greater ability to provide supporting evidence, which will enhance the information and evidence available to the Scottish ministers during the delegation process to inform the decision-making process. Amendment 10 requires the same consultation to be carried out before revising or revoking any delegation direction. It also requires the consent of the proposed delegate for such a revision or revocation. Both the Delegated Powers and Law Reform and Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committees sought clarification about what types of information would be published in the Notice of Direction under Section 4 of the Bill. Amendment 11 confirms the intention outlined in my letter to the uh, uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee to amend the Bill so that it is the direction itself which is published rather than a notice of the direction. As introduced, the Bill does not require any publication of the revision of a direction. As a result of Amendment 12, the Scottish Ministers will be required to publish the revised direction. Amendment 13 is in consequence of Amendment 11 to continue to provide that a notice of a revocation of a direction is required rather than the revocation itself. Amendment 14 is consequential on Amendment 11 and it provides that the information which must be included in a published direction is as follows. The fact that a direction has been given, the manager to whom the direct, a direction or revised direction has been given, the proposed delegate of the function of man, man, managing an asset and the asset in relation to which the direction or revised direction has been given. Information may be regarded to be commercially sensitive or commercially confidential, depending on individual circumstances, and this will be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, and it may be necessary to withhold such information from publication in certain circumstances. Amendment 15 tidies up the drafting of Section 47, subsection B, in consequence of Amendment 14. I encourage members to support them, and I move Amendment 9. Thank you. No other members have asked to speak, so um, the question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendments 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 and 15, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move 10 to 15 on block. Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question been put on Amendments 10 to 15? No. Nope. Okay, the question is that Amendments 10 to 15 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. We move on to Section 5. I call Amendment 36 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 30. I invite Andy Whiteman to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 16 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 2. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Moved. firmly. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the question is that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, move on to Section 6. I call Amendment 17 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group on its own. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 17. Convener, Amendment 17 amends the definition at Section 61B of the Bill of those community organisations which are eligible to become Scottish Crown Estate Managers so that the Scottish Ministers may only designate a body as a community organisation for the purposes of the Bill if it is an incorporated body. An unincorporated organisation has no separate legal personality from that of its members. If unincorporated community organisations were able to take on management functions of a Scottish Crown Estate asset, this would cause problems if it wished to enter into contracts, own property or engage employees. It cannot contract in its own name, so as a result, it is individual members rather than the organisation itself who would have to enter into contracts. There is a risk that office holders and sometimes even members of unincorporated organisations will incur personal liability with potentially serious financial consequences. For example, liabilities under a contract entered into on the organisation's behalf or for certain criminal offences committed by the organisation, such as health and safety, or to compensate third parties who suffer injury while using the Scottish Crown Estate asset or its facilities managed by the organisation. 
As unincorporated organisations cannot own property or take on a lease, this must instead be taken in the name of individual members. Difficulties then arise if that individual is no longer a member of the organisation, as the property title will still be held by them. Unincorporated bodies are also not subject to the same robust statutory, regulatory or transparency requirements as corporate bodies. Although they would still be required to meet the transparency and accountability requirements placed upon them by Section 18 of the Bill, along with the requirements relating to management plans and annual reports in Sections 22 and 24 of the Bill, other difficulties may arise due to the lack of legal requirements placed on their governance and lack of regulatory control. This amendment, restricting those community organisations which can be designated as a community organisation under Section 61B for the purpose of this Bill, and therefore that can be given responsibility for the function of managing a Scottish Crown Estate asset, to those which are corporate bodies, will provide additional reassurance for Parliament that those organisations taking on this role will be subject to a legal regime that allows them to do so effectively with less risk to individual members of those organisations. Furthermore, they will be subject to the same stringent statutory requirements both upon incorporation and in respect of ongoing regulation, which relate to transparency, governance and administration as those bodies under Section 61A taking on management of assets. I encourage members to support this amendment and I move Amendment 7. 17. Thank you. We have a couple of members wishing to speak. <coughs> John Scott. Um, thank you. Um, and can I say I welcome uh, this amendment um, 17 from the Cabinet Secretary. Um, we called essentially for this uh, at stage one. I think uh, I welcome the fact that uh, the moving to bodies corporate or full incorporation uh, will give protection to all parties, the Scottish Government, the Crown Estates and indeed individuals. Um, and as well as provide more uh, transparency and a very clear framework in which to operate. So I want to welcome this amendment. Thank you, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. And uh, I was hesitating as to whether to speak or not because John Scott has highlighted the issues I wanted to highlight. Although I do think this is a very important amendment. It's wise and protective in nature. Um, not least for community groups um, who may need sort of guidance on, on these issues as to not getting themselves into difficulties, if that doesn't sound patronising. Um, thank you. Thank you. Would the Cabinet Secretary like to wind up? I don't think there's anything further to say. The question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the question is that Section 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Right, move on to Section 7. Call Amendment 18 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with Amendments 40 and 41. I would point out that if Amendment 18 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 40 also in this group. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 18 and speak to all amendments in the group. Convener, Amendment 18 has been developed in response to the Committee's Stage 1 recommendations and strengthens the obligations on managers to manage assets in a particular way. It places an obligation on managers that they must have regard to the desirability of managing those assets in a way that is likely to contribute to the promotion and improvement of the wider socio-economic and environmental factors listed. We do not expect, nor would it be good management, to run the Scottish Crown Estate at a loss. We want managers to look beyond the balance sheet, but we don't want to tie managers' hands where it is not appropriate to do so, particularly since there is such a diverse portfolio and there are obligations contained within wider legislation that managers will have to comply with concerning sustainable development and the environment. The solution I have proposed seeks to maintain the value and income from Scottish Crown Estate assets while obliging managers to take account of wider socio-economic and environmental facts in carrying out that management. In fact, Crown Estate Scotland is currently developing tools to help them understand better, measure understand better, measure and monitor the social, economic and environmental value of the assets, and this will be used to inform future planning and investment decisions. Their intention is for this to become core business and also to share the information with other organisations with a view to driving inclusive and sustainable economic benefit. Amendment 18 strengthens the bill, but in a proportionate way. It is also important to highlight that Section 1 of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015 
requires any person carrying out functions of a public nature, as a manager of a Scottish Crown estate is doing, to have regard to the national outcomes in carrying out these functions. The new national performance framework, which the First Minister launched on 11th June, embeds the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So managers will be required, under existing legislation, to focus on creating a more successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through increased well-being and sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Similarly, the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009 places an obligation on public authorities to act in a way in the discharge of their functions that contributes to the government's goal of reducing emissions. I understand Am Amendment 40 also seeks to strengthen Section 7, subsection 2, by proposing that may should be changed to must and is linked to Amendment 41, which would remove all the wider factors except sustainable development. In my own evidence to the committee, I set out the clear imperative to ensure that the value of the Scottish Crown estate and the income arising from it is maintained Otherwise, the net revenue paid into the Scottish Consolidated Fund will be reduced to the detriment of the Scottish people as a whole. I also remain of the view that there is a clear imperative to ensure the value of the Crown Estate in Scotland is maintained. Devolution of the Crown Estate to Scotland under the terms of the Scotland Act 2016 resulted in the UK Government's block grant to Scotland being reduced by the estimated annual amount of net revenue earned by the Crown Estate. All of the income, minus any running costs, are now paid into the Scottish Consolidated Fund to benefit Scotland as a whole. There is therefore a public interest in ensuring that the value of these assets is at the least maintained. Less money being paid into the Scottish Consolidated Fund may have a knock-on effect on the operation of other schemes providing a wider social, socio-economic or environmental benefit. We must remember that this bill is not just about the management of the foreshore by community organisations or of the rural estates. It is also about the management of strategic national infrastructure. The telecoms cables, the oil and gas pipelines, the potential for offshore or renewable energy, the rights in the seabed beyond the 12 mile limit of territorial waters. I recognise the concerns expressed about section 7, subsection 2 of the bill as introduced, and that is why I lodged Amendment 18. My amendment delivers the recommendation of the committee from the Stage 1 report, and I'm concerned that Amendment 40 could have unintended consequences for such a diverse portfolio. Section 7, subsection 1 does not empower a manager to focus on short-term gain at the expense of longer-term benefits. Such a short-term approach is, by definition, incompatible with a duty to maintain and seek to enhance the value of the estate as a whole and the income arising from it. I am therefore confident that Amendment 18 is the right approach and that it delivers the helpful recommendation of the committee. I therefore move Amendment 18. I'd be happy, however, to discuss the issue further following Stage 2. This overarching duty affects key strategic decisions of managers, but members will be aware that under Section 11 of the Bill, managers are able to sell and lease, for example, assets for less than market value in the interests of economic development, regeneration, social well-being, environmental well-being or sustainable development. Amendment 41 proposes the removal of all of the wider factors in Section 72 except sustainable development. I clearly wish to see the reference to sustainable development retained in this section, but I am concerned that the removal of the reference to other socio-economic and environmental factors would be very unfortunate. I'm of the view it is desirable that asset managers contribute to wider public objectives, that economic development, regeneration, social well-being and environmental well-being, and removal of this requirement from Section 7.2 may act as a barrier to a manager actively considering and contributing to such factors. Whilst we all want our natural resources, including rural land and the seabed and foreshore, to be managed sustainably, I do not support Amendments 40 and 41. Amendment 40 um, uh, competes with my Amendment 18, which does not tie the hands of managers in taking strategic decisions. And Amendment 41 would remove the references to wider benefits beyond sustainable development, which were supported by stakeholders <coughs> during the devolution process and in response to the consultation on the long-term framework. However, as I've already highlighted, I do recognise the strength of feeling around uh, the actual wording uh, involved in 
uh, Amendment 40 and uh, Amendment 18. And I'd therefore be very happy to discuss the issue further following Stage 2. Uh, I nevertheless move Amendment 18 and urge members not to support Amendments 40 and 41. Okay, there are a number of members who wish to speak in them, but I'm going to invite Mark, Mark Ruskell first to speak in Amendment 40 and other members on the group. Yes, um, thank you, convener. Can I start by um, acknowledging uh, the movement that the Cabinet Secretary has, has made by introducing an amendment which does indeed pick up on the recommendation of the committee. However, I, I'm disappointed because I still think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what sustainable development is, which is a, is a shame given that sustainable development goals are incorporated into the government's objectives and have been part of our legislation and understanding for many years. Um, what 7.2 does is it creates a list, a list of things, economic development, regeneration, social well-being, environmental well-being, a list of things which are already incorporated into the very na nature and notion of sustainable development. The whole idea of sustainable development is that the economic, the social, and the environmental are considered as a whole. It's important because it means that we consider win-wins, and it's important because it means that when we consider the health of, uh, the economic health of our communities, we're also considering the environmental basis on which that economic health is delivered, an issue which I'm sure we'll return to in, in the next amendment. Now, I, I think it's important that this list under 7.2 isn't, isn't a pick-and-mix approach that a decision is justified on economic grounds without consideration of any environmental social impact, and likewise, a decision on environmental grounds isn't considered without um, due process and consideration of economic and regeneration social uh, considerations. So I think in, in terms of returning um, best value for these assets, in terms of um, enhancing the value of these assets for future generations, we need to put sustainable development front and centre, um, and, and sustainable development incorporates all of those other items that are listed under 7.2. Therefore, I feel that those other items are, are unnecessary, and that's why I'm moving this amendment. We have some other members wishing to make comment. John Scott. Um, thank you, um, convener. Um, I just wanted to speak uh, to this amendment, uh, the Cabinet Secretary's amendment. Uh, number 18, and while it may have been the committee's view um, at stage one that um, it should be must in, instead of may, or that there should be movement in this, I actually am um, the view, and the Scottish Conservatives are of the view that um, the, the bill as introduced is absolutely fine. Um, in terms of the word used in the Cabinet Secretary's amendment, desirability, I'm not quite certain what that means in, in law or what the effect of it is in law, and I'd certainly welcome an, exclamation, um, an explanation of that. Uh, similarly, I don't support Mark Ruskell's Amendment 40, um, nor will I be supporting Amendment 41, because I believe the bill as drafted is, 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 is quite sufficient. And, and while I take his point about this creating a list, it once again highlights the, the, the lack of understanding, as he has said, of a clear definition of what sustainable development means, because I suspect that he and the Cabinet Secretary are not on the same page as to what sustainable development means, at the very least in this regard. And I think if you asked all members around this room to write down on a piece of paper what they believed sustainable development to be, you would get many different answers. Um, so I think we're as well with the list, which again uh, reinforces my view that we should be staying with um, um, this clause as it is drafted. Um, and further, like the Cabinet Secretary, I, I believe um, um, that Crown Estate Managers, in the terms of me, um, should have the maximum flexibility to maximise all the benefits that the Crown Estate can give both to the Scottish people and to the Scottish Government. Um, and I think that is my position. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Convener. I speak to Amendment 41 in relation to the deletion of four items from the list therein, in 7.2. Um, specifically, if we delete social wellbeing, 
Let's just consider examples of activities that would then not be possible because no reasonable person would imagine them sustainable development. An example might be uh, where uh, there is a Crown Estate uh, property and there is a property on that piece of land which is derelict, which actually the community would benefit from the demolition and restoration of the area concerned to simply being a grass area. I'm not sure that's sustainable development, but it might well promote social well-being uh, in a particular uh, community. And it certainly uh, uh, isn't, isn't, isn't development at all. It's the opposite of development. It's undevelopment, you might almost say. Similarly, if I look at environmental well-being, it might be uh, that there is a piece of ground that is subject to uh, uh, previous industrial contamination. Uh, and uh, the appropriate uh, response of the community to that might well be to wish to decontaminate that land. Visually, it might remain absolutely the same. Uh, we might do nothing with it, and that might be the right thing to do with it after decontamination. That, too, would not be development. It, it, it would be a perfectly environmentally friendly and sustainable thing to do, uh, but I can't see that it would be encompassed in the definition of sustainable development. So on those two headings in particular, and with the examples I've given, I would find it difficult to support anything that deleted social well-being or environmental well-being uh, from what the manager may or indeed must do. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. Um, I've added uh, my support to Mark Ruskell's Amendment 40, which places uh, an obligatory <coughs> duty on managers to promote the improvement of, um, of Scotland um, in the ways that is clarified in, in his amendment. Um, colleagues may remember I spoke on this issue at stage one, um, and there was a, a good dialogue, if I may say so, with the Cabinet Secretary at that stage, um, and I welcome the consideration that has been given to this issue, and I recognise the Cabinet Secretary um, may have worded her amendment in order to avoid a situation where the nature of assets might be meeting one of the factors, um, might be a, a practical impossibility. If this is the case, I would welcome some more um, discussion on this um, in the future, because I, I don't think we're perhaps quite there with, with either amendment. I, I would <coughs> still um, very much support the word must being in there. Um, and Amendment 40 does strengthen the duty um, uh, for the, the factors involved. Um, and I just think that we need to look at it further. So, uh, yes, I will. Um, just for clarity, I, I note that uh, Amendment 18 says the manager must have regard. Is that in line with what the member is seeking? That is in line with what I'm seeking, but the, I think the word desirability is weak, and I would like to see that um, firmed up. Okay. I think that uh, uh, there's further discussion to be had on, on, on that word. I'm sorry to be perhaps seeming to dance on the head of a pin, but that's where I am. <laughs> um, and sorry, I hadn't, I hadn't finished, yeah. convener, if that's all right. Um, uh, so I would ask Mark Ruskell to consider withdrawing um, his uh, Amendment 40, um, and I don't know if it's appropriate to ask the Cabinet Secretary to withdraw an amendment, but I would do the same if I'm allowed to do that <laughs> with 18. Um, uh, and I'm not minded, though, to support Amendment 41, um, leaving only sustainable development as a mandatory factor, um, leaving out the other four factors. Um, and it's actually not for the same reasons as my um, committee colleague, Stuart, Stevenson, because I actually think that the examples he gave are indeed sustainable development, because sustainable development can involve the removal of something that is no longer sustainable. Um, however, I think while there is a clear understanding of what sustainable development is, to my mind, um, and I know um, John Scott and others disagree, but I think there is a, a, a clear definition of it, I do not know that everybody follows that and agrees with that. And I think that such words, if I give one example, as regeneration, are important factors that need to stay in, in that list because regeneration is so much part of what we're doing in Scotland for rural communities, coastal communities, and so many of the communities that are affected by um, this, this devolution bill. So um, 
although I understand that economic development, social well-being, and environmental well-being, as um, the points made by um, my colleague Mark Ruskell, are indeed all part of sustainable development, as is regeneration. I think it's pretty good to spell it out. So I would not be supporting um, Amendment 41 at this stage. Thank you. Alec Rowley. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that the Cabinet Secretary has taken on board what the committee said by bringing forward uh, the amendment at 18, although I don't think it is strong enough. That said, I think the Cabinet Secretary did say that she would be willing to have further discussion on that matter, and I think that would be the best way forward at this stage, so hopefully um, Mark Ruskell will, will consider uh, not pushing at this, this point in time. And likewise, I agree with others, I wouldn't be able to support 41 because I, I think it is stronger to leave those, those, those other definitions in. Would the Cabinet Secretary like to wind up and respond? Um, yeah, I, I just want to just pick up on a couple of points. First of all, on the, the issue of the use of the word desirability, which I think one or two members have said. In fact, that is a fairly common drafting um, constru construct. So it's not an unusual terminology that we've dreamt up out of nowhere. It's, it's, it's one of those things like, you know, a reasonable person where, where it's a kind of widely understood uh, uh, way of, of, of constructing uh, um, a, a, a form of duty, which isn't an absolute legal duty. So it's a, it's, you know, it's, it's a normal uh, process. So basically what you're, what you're really trying to ensure is that we don't end up in a very diverse portfolio imposing on that something that means all of the factors in the list might have to be kind of looked at even when they're not actually relevant to very particular circumstances. It's a, you know, and, and we are trying to find a kind of line in between these things uh, in, in this conversation because there isn't a purpose in, in forcing a, a manager down a tick box exercise when, when half of it simply doesn't, doesn't apply. So that's one of the things that we need to think about, making sure that we're not imposing uh, uh, unnecessary constraints. Um, that, that, uh, yeah. Through the convener. Um, could, could the Cabinet Secretary then perhaps explain, um, would there be an obligation on managers to explain why they haven't taken something into account? Well, Otherwise, I, I just feel it's going to I slide I think at the moment, that's not, what the, that's not what the amendment says, but that no. might be a useful area for conversation about about you know, how we might look at this and take it forward in, in a way which ends up not tying the hands of, of, of managers, which is we, we are trying to avoid a situation where managers are, 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 are tied by things that aren't actually particularly uh, relevant. And uh, it may be an area where we have to think about guidance. It may be an area where there's a, there's a, a, a way to come back and have a look at this. I think we're all trying to get to the same place. Um, I just want to make some remarks, too, about sustainable development. And I guess the conversation that's already been had shows the slight danger of relying entirely on simply the sustainable development phrase. And I just wanted to reiterate what I had said in my, uh, my uh, comments at the start, which is we already have uh, an obligation f deriving from the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015 that does require any manager carrying out functions of a public uh, nature, and that's what this is about, this is what the Crown Estate Bill is about, it requires them to have regard to the national outcomes in carrying out these functions. And the National Performance Framework does embed the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So, so in a sense, you know, at one level, that requirement in respect of sustainable development is already there and already imposed on them as it is imposed across all of those who are involved in uh, uh, carrying out uh, functions of a public nature. So in a sense that is, you know, that requirement is already there under existing legislation. Um, the, the, the more detailed list it is one which I think, from my perspective, is one that we would think is appropriate to consider and keep in the bill, um, partly for some of the interesting 
conundrums that are raised inevitably by my colleague Stuart Stevenson, who will always find <laughs> some, uh, uh, something of that nature. But maybe what he's doing is highlighting an issue where there might actually be some debate about it, and, and, and whereas keeping the list removes that debate. Thank and I think you. Claudia Beamish has already said that, so I move Amendment 18. Thank you. Okay, from the word comment, the question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. Okay, we have a division. Just give me a second. Right. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands now? Thank you. And those against? It doesn't leave anyone. Okay. John, did you vote? You voted again. Are four total votes against? It's five. The for the amendments, agreed. not agreed. Okay. And then you have to okay. So therefore, I call Amendment 40 in the name of Mark Ruskell. I already debated with Amendment 18. I invite Mark Ruskell to move or not move. Not moved. Not moved. Okay. So I'm down. I call Amendment 41 in the name of Mark Ruskell. I already debated with Amendment 18. I invite Mark Ruskell to move or not move. Not moved. The question then is that section seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. The question is that section eight be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. Right. I call amendment 42 in the name of Mark Ruskell and a group on its own. I invite Mark Ruskell to move and speak to amendment 42. Thanks very much, convener. And um, I'd like to start by... Um, perhaps just indicating the reason why I brought forward this amendment. This amendment attempts to enshrine uh, a golden rule uh, that's applied to the harvesting of kelp for many years, if not generations. It's a rule that's ensured that the kelp harvesting sector has stayed in business and that the very environmental resource that that sector relies on is protected for future generations. Uh, and the rule is, the golden rule is really quite simple. Um, the rule is that kelp should be harvested in a way that doesn't prohibit the regrowth of the individual plant. And the form of words which I've incorporated into the amendment is actually reflected in the licenses that are issued to those who hand harvest kelp at the moment. Uh, it, it comes from those very licenses. It's a very well-established principle. Now, what my amendment doesn't do is it doesn't ban uh, mechanical harvesting of kelp, but it does set a very clear expectation that it must be harvested in a way that doesn't prohibit the regrowth of the individual plant. Now, if we were to consider um, forests on land, um, these days we wouldn't be clear felling uh, ancient woodland. Uh, we may consider um, perhaps pollarding or coppicing an individual tree, um, but it wouldn't be good practice to clear fell um, a forest in that way. And much as the same with uh, kelp forests, it's not sustainable to be clear felling kelp <coughs> forests as well. Um, and I think perhaps the, the difficulty here is that once an area is clear felled, once an area is dredged of kelp, um, it will take many years uh, for the bare rock, the exposed rock, to regrow uh, the kelp. Uh, and, and in some cases, due to the changing ecological conditions, it may be impossible uh, for these kelp forests to re-establish on areas which have been um, stripped of their habitat. So in many ways, once these kelp forests are gone from a particular area, they may be gone forever or certainly for a very long time. And once they're gone, uh, we lose the benefits that these kelp forests deliver. Now, I'm sure many members have had uh, correspondence over the last uh, few weeks, or if not the last few months, about 
proposals to mechanically dredge kelp and what the benefits of kelp are to our coastal communities and our environment. But perhaps if I could just pick one example which is particularly um, underlined for me the importance of kelp. Um, my understanding is that kelp forests provide a really important nursery for juvenile fish, particularly cod, saith, pollock, the white fish that, of course, our you know, fishes, fishing communities depend on. Um, and when kelp dredging was introduced in Norway, uh, surveys going back to areas that have been dredged found that there was over a 90% reduction in the juvenile fish in these areas. Um, so we'd be removing the nurseries which support our whitefish sector. Um, also the roots which are pulled up, the, the holdfasts as they're called. The holdfasts provide a very important habitat for crab and lobsters. And I think this is one of the few environmental issues where I've actually seen the whitefish sector and the creeling sector come together mm -hmm. in opposition against mechanical dredging. I, I can't think of another issue uh, which has really brought so many uh, diverse stakeholders together uh, in their concerns. Um, kelp forests are priority marine features. Uh, they're vulnerable to climate change, so we should be protecting them. And if we look, of course, at the uh, policies from Natural England, um, they're advising against uh, mechanical harvesting. So I really don't think in Scotland we should be engaged in a race to the bottom over environmental standards. Um, having said that, I also believe we shouldn't be stifling innovation where a business can legitimately come forward uh, with a sustainable way to mechanically harvest kelp. But there should be this golden rule applied, this legal backstop, and I'll read it out again, that kelp should be harvested in a way that doesn't prohibit the regrowth of an individual plant. It's common sense, and that's why I intend to move this amendment today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've got some comment from other members, but before we do, I'd, I'd like to make, make comment myself. As a new, a new convener, uh, one of my concerns, although I'm hugely sympathetic to everything that Mark Ruskell has said and the idea behind it, one of my concerns has been that we haven't taken evidence on this and allowed the opportunity for members to really drill down into what's, what's involved in this, and myself included. Um, another issue that I had as well, I mean, coming myself from a, a background that's been involved in in, in uh, oil and gas safety was the fact that uh, often innovation around any kind of measures can also mean that things are safer for workers which take away the, the need to do any manual handling and that would be an area that I would have liked to explore should we had the opportunity to take evidence on this but I'll, I'll pass on to my, my fellow members. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, in relation to kelp I'm as uh, big a fan of kelp as uh, uh, Mark Ruskell, and indeed all the environmental uh, observations he, uh, he has made have uh, considerable merit. And indeed, uh, to see the Creole and whitefish sectors uh, agreeing, I'm delighted to see that they're agreeing on something, uh, uh, often, often areas where uh, there appears to be some uh, difference of view. Uh, I think the real issue is whether this is the right way to address uh, the, the issue of how we need to protect uh, wild kelp and ensure that it can regenerate. It, it's covered, uh, the, the proposal, as I understand it, <coughs> is covered by um, line uh, item six in section 21 of the Marine Scotland uh, Act of 2010, which essentially uh, means you need a license if you're going to use a vehicle, vessel, aircraft, etc. Uh, to, uh, uh, to conduct uh, harvesting uh, uh, of kelp. Uh, and, and indeed, there is a process, uh, I understand, uh, undergoing, uh, uh, un underway on that subject. Um, I did uh, think that uh, I, I, too, have received a lot of correspondence. One of them, and, and I only choose one, uh, the North Mint Shellfish Association. <coughs> But, but the particular point they make, the ecological consequences of the industrial harvesting of kelp have not been specifically evaluated. And I think that goes to the heart of uh, whether this is the time and place to do this. Um, I, I will find it quite easy to support uh, protecting kelp um, in, in an appropriate way, but to have it come into this bill without our having considered it, the convener has made uh, reference to that, and have taken the evidence from the two sides of the argument and make sure that when we move forward on the subject, we do so on the basis of sound 
uh, science. I have no knowledge whatsoever to reject anything that uh, Mark Rusko uh, has said, and I'm not going to look terribly hard for it, but I think the committee uh, in, in considering things like this uh, should always make sure that it acts on the basis uh, of information and uh, understanding of, of, of the wider issues. Bluntly, if we were to act in the absence of that, I, what sometimes happens, and it's always unhelpful when it happens, you end up in the court uh, with a judicial review, uh, possibly from the company concerned. Although I suspect the economic value of this might not justify the quite expensive process of that. But I think there's considerable risk in doing it here in the way that Mark uh, Rusko is proposing. And I would invite him to uh, uh, withdraw that amendment. And he did work with the government to see if the, the provisions of the Marine Scotland Act are going to lead to the out right outcome, or indeed whether there's another way of doing it that means this committee or another committee uh, has the appropriate opportunity to take all the evidence before uh, coming to a final conclusion about the particular way in which we protect. Uh, seek uh, wild cop. It's not that I don't want to protect it, it's how we do it and where and when we do it. Convener. Richard Lyle. Yeah, thank you, Convener. I also want to preserve and protect and ensure that uh, you know, it's there for future generations. And we've all received numerous emails and Twitter tweets via the, the harvesting of, of, of sea kelp over the last few days and weeks. But I'm also reminded, as other members are, that this committee has not taken any evidence on this from those that would be affected from any other interested parties in this matter, especially since the activity, I understand, can't go ahead without a marine licence, which includes robust process for assessing environmental impacts. And am I not correct? There's not even a marine application licence for this. But I do understand the concerns, however, and I certainly will be um, taking notes of what is said in future by future members uh, in the way that I will vote on this issue. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I want to speak in support of Mark Rascal's Amendment 42. It is absolutely right that the newly devolved Crown Estate should be tasked with considering whether any future licensing for harvesting continue to be given on the basis of sustainability. Mark Ruskell's amendment will ensure that licenses are not granted, and I quote, from any area of the seabed under their management where such harvesting could inhibit the regrowth of the individual plant. Kelp is, as we have heard from Mark Ruskell, a priority marine feature. This <coughs> is, a, is a clear indication that there, is, um, si there are serious issues around its protection that need to be considered. Um, and um, sustainable kelp harvesting has a long tradition in our Scottish inland waters. It's been done with care and sensitivity to both our marine environment and the other jobs which depend on the kelp forests. Future kelp harvesting must, in my view, of course, be, continue to be sustainable and must not threaten the seabed habitats, sea life, and indeed the protected seabirds that feed on the sand eels therein. Nor should it threaten the nurseries for the young um, pollock cod and other whitefish. I have taken a keen interest in marine environmental issues over the past six years since being on this committee and its predecessor. One of the significant issues to consider is that kelp forests, along with seagrass and other areas of our inshore waters, are inval invaluable carbon sinks which merit great respect. There is now recognition in the present climate change plan of the developing research into these complex issues, which we ignore at our collective peril. There is also Norwegian research I understand, although I have not been able to investigate it further, which shows an, an evaluation of the failure to regrow uh, kelp after harvesting. And I just um, point that out as well. We should be taking the precautionary principle uh, in relation to kelp harvesting. And it is also important to ensure that sustainable jobs are supported in our coastal communities for now and the future. There must be careful analysis of whether the present marine biopolymers uh, proposal would lead to sustainable harvesting or not. Uh, can I just finish this point, please? But I do not see it as my role in committee today to comment on this on an individual application. That would be inappropriate. So I'm deliberately avoiding pointing out research or expert views which relate to this specific possible development. Uh, yes, I'll take an intervention. I don't think anyone disagrees with the point that you're making, Claudia. You know, the point I made earlier was we haven't taken evidence. So I welcome what you've brought in 
uh, to the fore. But again, I wish we would have discussed this well before now. Well, I understand that point, but it's because of the approach of, of a number of, of groups and individuals um, between stage one and stage two, uh, possibly partly on the back of this application, which I don't want to refer to anymore, possibly not. But there is plenty of evidence in relation to climate change, in relation to carbon mm -hmm. sinks, in relation to marine protected um, uh, features that actually point us in a direction. And the direction I believe it points us in is, is in the direction of supporting Mark's amendment. And I finally want to end, please, by saying that um, I do see it as important to highlight that in terms of this amendment, um, there are many present jobs which are sustainable and depend on the protection and enhancement of the marine environment as clearly stated as an aim in the Marine Act 2010. These include creel fishers, and we have heard from um, Alistair Sinclair only, only yesterday, I acknowledge, that um, the 400 members, um, uh, he represents 400 members and the creel fishers are in support. And we've heard that the whitefish sector has also put in information to us about their concerns. Um, it's also marine tourism operators, hand scallop divers, and um, kayak, um, uh, comp sea kayak companies, um, and hand divers for kelp itself. I've had emails from some of these asking for my support for amendment for the amendment today, and I ask all other members to seriously consider whether this puts down a robust marker at this point in time to appropriately protect our kelp forests. Thank you. And we have some other members wanting to come in, but before I do, can I ask that you speak to the chair if you want to make a further comment to your original comment. Um, I'm not in entirely keen on this uh, intervention strategy. This is a committee. I'd rather that people speak through the chair and I'll take you if I have time. Uh, Finlay Carson. Convener, uh, and, I, and I welcome Mark Ruskell's uh, open statement where he's, he's brought something into the public domain that certainly needs to be discussed. However, uh, I do agree in many ways with his statement, uh, but he also stated there was a well-established principle when it comes to harvesting of wild kelp. Uh, and I would agree that uh, with much of he says, but I think it may be somewhat inappropriate to bring the legislation in uh, under the, the Crown Estate Bill, and it should be, or it would be more appropriately uh, dealt with through the licensing system, which, uh, if we get the opportunity, should be viewed with uh, a, a scientific background, uh, and, and, and actually we can see what the environmental and uh, economic impact of uh, harvesting of, of kelp would be. So I would welcome further work on that, uh, and I do welcome Mark Ruskell's uh, amendment, which will bring this into the, the, the public domain, but uh, I'm not sure that it's appropriate that it's dealt with under the Crown Estate legislation. Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, Chair. There's no doubt, uh, as we're hearing, that this is uh, a subject, uh, convener, uh, given the, the social media traffic and, and emails that I've received, uh, as well as uh, the the submissions that have come in uh, to the committee uh, in recent days, <clears throat> and I would agree with you, convener and, and others, that um, um, this committee must take uh, more evidence on this before uh, reaching a conclusion. However, uh, I think it's worth stressing uh, once again that this is an enabling bill, uh, and we're discussing an issue that's not as yet uh, the subject of a, a marine licence application, uh, although I believe a, a scoping report has been submitted to Marine Scotland, but I don't want to dwell on, on that application. But um, I have concerns that were strained into uh, operational issues and, and what's effectively, uh, as I say, an enabling bill. Um, however, I also have to say that I do have some sympathy for the, the concerns that, that have been raised. But I would ask a question to, to Mark Ruskell, uh, and that is if he thinks uh, if this amendment, uh, amendment is accepted today uh, at stage two, you know, what amendments are we likely to uh, see from members uh, being lodged at stage three, seeking to ban uh, managers from, from doing other things. Um, so as I would suggest that this amendment sits out of kilter with the general duties of this bill, um, which is my main concern on this, and uh, ideally I would like to see Mark Ruskell withdraw the amendment for the time being. Thank you. John Scott. Um, thank you, convener. I think most of what I was going to say has already been said, but I will reiterate it nonetheless. But uh, unlike uh, Claudia Beamish, um, 
I'm not convinced that this is the correct place to introduce uh, this piece of legislation into this bill. I don't believe it to be appropriate. Um, I do, of course, note the significant concerns of uh, the, the different industry bodies out there who have contacted us. I think both uh, have, have points of view. Like others, I hugely regret the fact that we haven't taken evidence on this subject. Um, and Stuart Stevenson made a valid point when he said it might not yet be too late to take evidence. I know there is a precedent for taking evidence at stage two. It, it's, it's unusual, but Stuart is a man who knows the rules and probably knows what I'm talking about. Um, and so I think there is a process to be followed here, and I'm not sure that the proper process that's expected of this parliament is being followed, um, especially when I think Claudia Blimish Bayser said she was avoiding expert views. Um, and I find that surprising. Um, of course. Of course. Just for clarification, that was specifically in relation to um, the, the dredging application, which I was sent information about. So I wasn't going to refer to that Norwegian example for that reason. But notwithstanding, if I may respond in that regard, you've been quite keen to extol the case of the people whom you are obviously representing. Um, um, and, and very strongly. In broad uh, terms, yes. And, and without giving any credence to any arguments that have been presented otherwise. So I believe that there is a process to be followed, and I think it is possible to act in haste and repent at leisure. And, uh, and I would urge Mark Ruskell to withdraw this probing amendment, and perhaps the, the, perhaps the Cabinet Secretary might wish to discuss such... Uh, his amendment and to see what can be achieved at stage three, if at all. But I think there is a, perhaps a better way of going about this than the one that is being suggested in this amendment. Thank you. Alec Rowley. I support this amendment for the reasons set out by Mark Ruskell and Claudia Beamish. Uh, but I just want to pick up on a couple of points. Uh, Angus MacDonald talked about managers being asked to ban um, the, the harvest in the whale kelp, but that's not what this this amendment is about. And if this amendment was was about that, then these points that have been made about the science and having the evidence, I think would be far more relevant. But what this is asking is it's asking that, that managers must not grant a right to carry out harvesting of whale kelp, where that principle of harvesting would inhabit the regrowth of individual plants. And that's what this, this, this amendment is about. And I think it's perfectly appropriate, therefore, that that, that, that guidance and, and, and that, that clear direction is given on this, in this bill to managers so that we do protect and ensure that where the harvest and the well, well kelp is being taken place, then that principle, established principle, is, is put into play. So I think it's, it's a myth in a sense to say the science, if we were taught about bans, then yeah, but that's not what this amendment is speaking about. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> now, um, it's been pointed out that during Mark Ruskell's uh, submission, you did not formally move your amendment. Would you like to take the opportunity to do so now? I, I, I would like to yeah. take the opportunity okay. to do that. Thank, you. Thank you. And then uh, invite, invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to the amendments in this group. Thank you, Convener. Um, I have very considerable legal difficulty at the moment, uh, given that uh, there is a current uh, marine licensing process being undertaken, albeit at the pre-application stage. Um, and I am the responsible minister uh, for whom that would end up being a decision-making uh, process. I cannot, therefore, uh, make a great deal of comment about this, and I certainly cannot indicate any value judgment in respect of this issue one way or the other, uh, because that would be uh, instantly prejudicial uh, to an ongoing process. I want people to be very clear about that. The pre-application process is part of the process. Thank so you. this amendment 
and I'm going to have to pick my way through a minefield now just to try and make a couple of points in respect of the situation that we are in today. This bill is about the general management requirements for the assets, not specific activities. And it's also about devolution of management of Crown Estate assets to those with an interest in those assets. And we've had discussions about community organisations, local authorities, etc., with a view to increasing local control over decision making. So the bill already contains powers for the transfer or delegation of the management of a Crown Estate asset. And these include the ability to restrict the activities that a manager can undertake as a manager. And that does reflect the ethos of the bill to allow decisions to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Amendment 42 isn't about trying to give effect to those principles at all, but it's trying to bring about effectively a ban on the conduct of one particular marine activity, and that is the seaweed harvesting uh, uh, that's under uh, uh, discussion. And I simply uh, uh, make the point that other members have made that thus far there has been no evidence gathering that would, from my perspective, adequately, adequately inform the opinion of committee members one way or the other. Um, and this is being proposed in the absence of any proper process. There is uh, an existing robust marine licensing regime that regulates activities. Uh, the pre-application process is part of that. Uh, and as I indicated at the outset, that is already uh, underway. The amendment therefore cuts across what the Scottish Parliament has already legislated for within the last decade, a statutory regime which requires licences to be granted before an activity of this type can be carried out. And that regime does include a full assessment of the environmental impacts. To take a decision before those impacts have even been assessed does not seem appropriate and is certainly not evidence-based. And that's not to say that we don't recognise that there are concerns about potential environmental impacts. However, as I indicated at the outset, I'm in an extraordinary position here in that I can't actually uh, really indicate a view one way or the other for fear of uh, creating a difficulty with the process that is already underway. Um, if Mark Ruskell insists on pressing this amendment, then I can only ask members to abstain. And I am, of course, happy to, con to continue to discuss this matter at stage three. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I invite, I invite Mark Ruskell to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment. Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Um, let me deal with one issue first. Um, is this an appropriate uh, bill to be considering such an amendment? I believe it is, because kelp is a property right of the Crown. Mm -hmm. Everything that is attached to the land forms part of the land, so it is an appropriate place to be considering uh, how kelp can be harvested sustainably. In terms of the process of, uh, of dealing with evidence and taking this bill through the Parliament, um, yes, I agree with members, it would have been better to have had evidence on this at stage one, but you know, sometimes events out there in the real world overtake the work of this parliament. We have to be fleet of foot, we have to respond to evidence and concerns um, that the public bring to us. Um, I believe that if this amendment was passed at stage two today, it would still give time to consider evidence and representations from stakeholders uh, and further discussions with government ahead of stage three and a final opportunity to amend this bill one way or another. Um, this isn't in, enshrining a new principle uh, into legislation. This is a well-established principle. And I want to emphasize, as Alex Raleigh and Claudia Beamish have, that this isn't a ban on a particular a proposal from a particular company. That's, that's irrelevant. Um, what this is doing is establishing a principle, a well-established principle that is, already exists in the licensing of hand harvesting of kelp around Scotland and has been in place for many years and it creates a level playing field with what other, other interests may wish to put forward uh, license applications to harvest kelp in the same way or in a different way. Um, it's not establishing a new precedent. It's merely taking an existing precedent in licensing and ensuring that that has a more robust legal basis. It doesn't determine uh, what's a good way to harvest kelp or a bad way to harvest kelp. It just sets out a key golden rule which is it must be harvested in a way it doesn't prohibit the regrowth of an individual plant. And that's why I'll be moving it. 
Be pressing your amendment. I'll be pressing the amendment, yes. yeah. The question then is that Amendment 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Okay, we have a division. Okay. Okay, can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands now? And those against? And those abstaining? So we have the total votes for three, total votes against zero, and total abstentions six. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. Not agreed. Okay. okay. The question is that sections nine and ten be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes, we are. We move on to section eleven. I call amendment nineteen in the name of the cabinet secretary. Already debated with amendment one. I invite the cabinet secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. I call Amendment 20 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 20 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. On Section 12, I call Amendment 21 in the name of the Cabinet Move. Secretary. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Right, I call amendment 43 in the name of Liam MacArthur, group with amendment 44. I invite Liam MacArthur to move amendment 43 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Can I start by offering an apology to yourself, colleagues, and to the Cabinet Secretary for my late arrival this morning. There's a Justice Committee meeting ongoing to which I'll have to return afterwards, but apologies uh, for, uh, for that. Um, unlike colleagues, I haven't had the benefit of um, sitting through the evidence at, at stage one. Uh, nevertheless, the uh, devolving management of Crown Estate Scotland uh, to the communities with most interest in and reliance on uh, the future use of those assets has been an issue I've been pursuing since uh, before I was elected in 2007. Uh, I therefore welcome uh, the bill and what it can help achieve, although I think, like most of us, accept that it can and should be uh, strengthened, not least to my mind, in unlocking and securing the benefits for communities arising from developments in the marine environment at the stage out to 12 nautical miles. To be clear, this includes but shouldn't be limited to the revenue accrued through rental agreements. I think it's also important um, that decisions over how those benefits are set, raised and allocated are taken at a local level. And this is the underlying principle behind uh, the amendments I am uh, moving. And I appreciate there, there may be those who are concerned uh, about adding to the costs of pr uh, projects, particularly in early phase, where they may uh, be more vulnerable. However, I'm confident the flexibility in my proposals and indeed the mutual interest uh, of local authorities and developers in avoiding a situation where projects are effectively throttled at birth uh, would ensure that a proportionate and potentially a phased approach uh, is uh, taken. In each in instance, of course, there would be a requirement uh, for detailed prior consultation. Uh, as colleagues will be aware, the Orkney and Zetland County Council Acts already provide evidence and probably a blueprint of how this might work. Over the last 40 years, local management and commercial extraction of marine resources have been achieved through formal agreements uh, such as work licensing under the Orkney and Zetland Acts and agreements with the oil industry. These arrangements have worked well, uh, both in the interests of the local communities, but also, I think, uh, at a national level too. That track record of our island authorities has been recognised and underpins uh, how inshore regional uh, marine planning is being taken forward uh, and should be extended. The principle that local authorities should be compensated for disruption and inconvenience associated with development work seems widely accepted. Uh, we see this uh, in territorial planning, uh, albeit on a voluntary basis, and we're starting to see it emerging in terms of uh, offshore developments, although again on a voluntary uh, and I think patchy basis. 
Fundamentally, however, communities that have to endure the burden of development, dislocation, risk and exploitation of scarce resources must be involved in decision-making about which developments happen and, and uh, which do not. A community benefit is a necessary adjunct of that decision-making process. None of this uh, convener should be unduly controversial. Indeed, much of what I have said sits comfortably with the commitments uh, made by the Government in their prospectus empowering Scotland's island communities. And I realise the amendments may need uh, some fine-tuning uh, ahead of uh, Stage 3, and I am happy to work with the Cabinet Secretary and our officials uh, to achieve something is, that is workable. But I hope today uh, the Committee can see fit to agree the uh, principles underlying uh, these uh, amendments so that we can take them forward. And on that basis, I move Amendment uh, 43. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I have just got a small issue to raise, uh, and that is simply where uh, there are adjacent local authorities um, that might be said to share an area. Uh, an example I would give would be between uh, Butte and Arran, uh, where uh, there would be the 12 mile from each of the local authorities would overlap. Um, that uh, I'd be interested just to hear how uh, that is dealt with, because the particular uh, definition that's used at 2B is from mean high water springs out to 12 nautical miles. And in the case of Butte and Arden, that will overlap the two adjacent local authorities. Thank you, convener. And uh, if, uh, if Liam MacArthur does indeed press his amendment today, rather than um, agree to any offer of discussion prior to stage three, I'll, I will be keen to support it. Um, I do think that it, it's a very complex issue, and uh, I think that um, having looked at um, uh, what the island, island local authorities have stated, their, their arguments seem to be cogent and coherent about that that, that is where the um, benefit um, should go for distribution. I think that um, they, they know their communities well, and as long as the criteria are set appropriately, which occasionally to be blunt, they aren't on some um, issues to do with um, uh, onshore wind, which I have experience of, um, then I, I, I think it's, it's very good to support. I also think that the possibility of delays to the revenue coming in might be appropriate in relation to start-ups. I, I don't think anyone would want to jeopardise the, the jobs and indeed the renewable energy possibly, but it may be other um, industries. Um, uh, such as carbon capture and storage, if we go down that road, that are, are just developing. Uh, so, um, in principle, a yes um, from myself, but possibly, um, as I say, there may be further discussion to be had. Thank, thank you. you. Mark Ruskell. Uh, thank you, convener. I had a question, really, and, and it was in relation to um, how this may or may not impact on the planning system and, and licensing, uh, marine licensing, because my understanding is that at the moment, community benefit isn't a material consideration. Uh, it's considered as a, as a voluntary contribution. Uh, it may be desirable. Um, it is desirable, you know, through, and is reflected in government policy. But it doesn't form a material consideration uh, in planning. Uh, and I, I'm unclear about how it sits within marine licensing as well. So I'm just wondering if, if this is approved today, whether it, it, it actually changes that. In, in any way and actually elevates the status of community benefit in relation to these determination processes that exist elsewhere in legislation. Thank you. The Secretary to speak to the amendments in this group. Thank you, Convener. We are uh, currently resisting Amendment 43 and Consequential Amendment 44. Um, we think these are unnecessary given that Scottish Ministers have made a commitment to ensure that coastal communities will benefit from the net revenue from the Scottish Crown Estate marine assets. There are already wider arrangements in place which are promoted by the Scottish Government. In addition, the Scottish Government has for some time encouraged all renewables developers to provide community benefit, and I think that's the kind of thing that Mark Ruskell's just been talking about as part of any new project, and promotes good practice principles in relation to this. We also encourage aquaculture developers to evidence community benefit as part of any proposed new development. The Scottish Government has no powers to oblige developers to pay community benefits for such schemes. And this isn't necessary in practice, 
as there are examples of local community benefit schemes being put in place on a voluntary basis by developers in Scotland. With regard to ensuring local community benefit, we have had constructive discussions with COSLA and have agreed an interim mechanism for local authorities to receive a share of the net revenue out to 12 nautical miles. Now, having said that, uh, members uh, around the table may have noticed that I was having a vigorous conversation with an official to my left, um, because uh, I have to say that, and this sometimes happens with amendments uh, at any stage, that our reading of this amendment would impose a duty on the Scottish ministers to make regulations about a community benefits request scheme relating to Scottish Crown Estate assets within the Scottish Marine Region for the Orkney Islands, as defined in Article 8 of the Scottish Marine Region's Order 2015. Now, it may not be that Liam MacArthur intends to bring an amendment which is purely <laughs> related to the Orkney Islands, but it may be. Um, I can see that there would be advantage in a local press release along those lines. However, um, so our, our reading of this and our understanding of, of this is that the way it's currently drafted, it would actually apply only to the Orkney Islands Council. Now, um, I'm not certain <laughs> that that's entirely what is meant by this. And I don't, you know, that, that, is, that is perhaps something that we need to discuss. <laughs> um, arrangements are, and I'm, and I'm happy to have conversations with Liam MacArthur about this, because arrangements are being made to distribute the revenue to coastal council, councils later this year for the purpose of benefiting local communities. And we have agreed with COSLA that we will review the interim arrangements, including whether we can establish a closer link with the net revenue raised in a local authority area and how benefit to local communities can be assured. So there are already active conversations in and around this area. Um, so I would ask the member not to press amendments 43 and 44, um, and I am happy to engage with him uh, on a, a discussion about how we can perhaps give effect to what I suspect is a general feeling around this, uh, uh, rather better than has perhaps been drafted at the moment. Thank you. I invite Liam MacArthur to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendments. Uh, thank you, Convener. I think I should start by coming clean in relation to the Orkney um, specific focus of the uh, amendment. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure that was unintentional, but um, I, it, it may just become a kind of a muscle memory and force of habit. Um, I, I think it does illustrate, I, along with some of the other points, that uh, as I think I conceded in, in my opening remarks, these amendments um, were, were, were lodged with a view that they would almost certainly need um, some further uh, some further work. I think taking on the the, uh, the points that were raised during the, the debate, and I thank uh, Stuart Stevenson, Claudia Beamish and, and Mark Rusko uh, for making those points. I think in relation to, to Stuart Stevenson's point about adjacent local authorities, this does arise. Um, I, I, I think there is uh, already examples within marine planning that would um, point in a direction uh, that might address some of those, uh, whether it's competing interests or mutual interest, um, I, how those might be uh, properly balanced. Um, I welcome uh, Claudia Beamish's uh, support for, um, uh, for the principle underlying uh, the amendment. I think she's right, and I think the Cabinet Secretary has illustrated the complexity <coughs> of this. But I think the arguments, as she said, uh, put forward by local authorities uh, have been cogent and coherent in terms of articulating the underlying principle uh, behind them. Um, in terms of Mark Ruskell's point about the, the impact on marine licensing uh, and uh, community benefit not being a material uh, consideration in planning, I think, as I said in my, in my opening remarks, while, um, uh, while community benefit has been a feature um, of uh, planning uh, developments, of planning applications uh, in, uh, in land-based developments, this has been on a voluntary basis. It has been patchy. I know in my own Orkney constituency, I can point to examples of uh, in the early stages where this was, um, I, I think, fairly unsatisfactory. Um, and, and while uh, the, the, the process for arriving at that may, ha may have improved, uh, that communities are, are, are better sighted on, on what has been negotiated and other similar circumstances, it still remains the case uh, that that is uh, on a voluntary basis. And I think there's a concern uh, that for some of the developments we're looking at, uh, that uh, a, 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 a firmer right is, uh, is required. Uh, I note the conversations that uh, the Cabinet Secretary indicated are, are ongoing with COSLA. Um, I, I thank her 
further invitation to continue the discussions on what might be achieved at stage three. And on that basis, uh, I will not move Amendment uh, 43 at this stage. Thank you. So, Liam MacArthur seeks to withdraw Amendment number 43. Does any member object? No. So, a member, Amendment 43 is withdrawn. Okay. Now, that means the question is that section 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 22 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with Amendment 27, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 22 and to speak to both amendments in the group. Convener, Amendment 22 inserts a new section after Section 14, which makes provision about rights and liabilities. The amendment makes it clear that the costs and liabilities associated with managing a Scottish Crown Estate asset must be met from Scottish Crown Estate funds and cannot be met from any other funds that the manager has in respect of any other purpose. The amendment also gives the Scottish Ministers a power to make regulations transferring rights and liabilities between managers, which can be exercised at a time even when the management function is not also being transferred or delegated. This power is additional to the power contained in Section 3, subsection 1b, to transfer rights and liabilities, which may be used only at the time when a transfer of management of an asset is being made. The power relates to rights and liabilities relating to Scottish Crown Estate assets, former assets and historic Scottish assets, assets which once formed part of the Crown Estate in Scotland. Amendment 27 provides that regulations made under the new section will be subject to affirmative procedure if they textually amend an act and otherwise will be subject to the negative procedure. I move Amendment 22. Thank you. And no other members wish to speak. So and I imagine the Cabinet Secretary does not want to wind up. No. no. <laughs> the question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 15 to 19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 37 in the name of Andy Whiteman, Group with Amendments 38 and 39. I invite Andy Whiteman to move Amendment 37 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. I move Amendment 37. Um, section 20 of the Bill places a duty on Scottish Ministers to prepare a strategic management plan for the Scottish Crown Estate. Um, now, by way of introduction, I want to briefly spell out why I have lodged uh, these amendments. The Smith Commission recommended in Recommendation 32 that responsibility for the management of the Crown Estate's economic assets in Scotland and the revenue generated from those assets will be transferred to the Scottish Parliament. The management was devolved under the Scotland Act 2016, but the revenues were not. They remain reserved, notwithstanding that the Civil List Act 1952 provides that the revenues of the Scottish Crown Estate shall be paid into the Scottish Consolidated Fund. The reason for that ongoing reservation is yet to be established, but one explanation is that the Treasury were protecting the interests of the monarch and their successors, who have a, uh, who have a constitutional obligation to surrender the revenues of the Crown at the beginning of every uh, reign. And it's worth noting if that does not happen, then this bill uh, will be rendered meaningless. This failure to devolve the revenues is why Scottish ministers are having to have discussions with COSLA to work out a way of implementing their commitment to transfer 100% of the net revenues out to the 12 nautical miles to local authorities. The 2016 Act constrains the freedoms of this Parliament to legislate over management and provides no scope whatsoever to legislate in respect of revenues. That is why I lodged four amendments that would have exercised the devolved competence to legislate on Crown property rights that were provided in Section 3.1 of Part 1 of Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act 1998. Those amendments were to extinguish the Crown's rights in native oysters and mussels, extinguish the Crown's rights in the foreshore, extinguish the Crown's rights in the seabed, and extinguish the rights uh, of the Crown in naturally occurring gold and silver by repealing the Royal Mines Act of 1424. Uh, <clears throat> uh, these rights, in my view, are a feudal relic, an anachronism in relationship to any modern system of land tenure and should have no place uh, in that uh, system. Um, I was disappointed, however, the convener uh, ruled those amendments of being out with the scope uh, of uh, the bill. But by removing those rights from Scotland's system of land tenure, they would be taken out with the Crown Estate and out with the constraints imposed by both the 2016 Act and this bill, and indeed out with any attempt by a future monarch to refuse to surrender Crown revenues. 
Now, I will continue to make the case for doing this at stage three and be happy to enter discussions with the Minister if she is minded to contemplate such a move. So that is by way of explanation. And as an alternative to those amendments ruled out of scope, I have lodged an amendment that would place a duty on ministers um, to set out their view on the desirability of doing precisely those things that I would prefer be done today uh, in this bill. So amendments, 30, uh, amendments 38 and 39 uh, are designed to prevent this duty being delegated to Crown Estate uh, Scotland. So just to uh, be clear, Amendment 37, which is a substantive one, requires that in any strategic uh, plan for the Crown Estate Scotland that ministers um, uh, express their views on the desirability of extinguishing the Crown's property rights and interests in naturally occurring <coughs> oysters and mussels, the foreshore, the seabed and gold and silver, which is vested in the Crown under the Royal Mines Act of 1424, which incidentally I think is the oldest statute uh, on the Scottish statute book. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you. Let me uh, first congratulate uh, Andy Whiteman on uh, moving the bar backwards, the previous oldest uh, Act that I think we referred to in debate was the 1491 Common Good Act, uh, which he will he will he will recognise. So the 1424 uh, Royal Mines Act moves the boundary even further back. Um, in his remarks, uh, uh, Andy Whiteman uh, said that the effect of this is to abolish the Royal Mines Act. It is uh, quite a short act. Uh, it's but uh, two lines, and essentially. Uh, is uh, an act that nationalises the extract of silver uh, and, and gold, uh, where there are three half pennies of silver in one pound of lead, uh, so that they become the property of the Crown. And I, the question, therefore, is what is the effect of abolishing the act? Uh, therefore, it undoes the nationalisation and transfer of other people's assets to the Crown. Um, there is, I understand, only one gold mine uh, in Scotland. Uh, I understand that at the time uh, of the 1424 Act, uh, the location of that gold mine uh, was in land owned by the Campbells. Therefore, the abolition of the 1424 uh, Act is to transfer back to the Campbells their rights to attention. gold and uh, silver. I will. You will have an opportunity to, 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 to answer some of these points. I appreciate later. that, but at this stage, I'm happy. To, I, I just want to clarify that you, the intention. You, you, of... you will have a chance to. I'd like to hear from Stuart Stevenson, and then okay. we'll, you, can get, you can answer them. Um, in your... Now, if that's Mr. Uh, Whiteman's intention, well, fair enough, he's entitled to have that intention. Uh, it would not be one uh, that, that, that I would support. If, of course, he has, as he suggested, his amendments will abolish. Uh, the Royal Mounds Act. I'm not quite sure my reading of what before us says that, but it probably has that practical effect. Um, then I think we kind of need to know then what, and I'm not sure uh, that the uh, amendments before us currently uh, deal with the then what question. Convener. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I'm clear that anything that will abolish further feudalism in Scotland in this day and age is, is an imperative. I think <coughs> the issues are complex and I haven't, perhaps just to be open about it, made the time to delve into the detail of this. Um, and uh, it's no excuse to say I haven't had the time, I just haven't made the time. However, I do think that um, in, in these circumstances I would ask um, if Andy Whiteman would consider withdrawing so there can be further detailed discussion um, with the Cabinet Secretary and others who have an interest in making sure that this is um, the direction of travel um, for, for the future. So we, hopefully something can come back at stage three. OK, thank you. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to the amendments in this group. Um, um, thank you. Uh, Convener Amendment 37 would require the Scottish Ministers to set out their views on extinguishing the Crown's rights to the property rights and interests in the listed assets, oysters and mussels, the foreshore, the seabed and gold and silver. I should highlight that the right to gather naturally occurring oysters and mussels has not formed part of the Crown Estate in Scotland since November 2014, as those rights were transferred to the Scottish Ministers. As such, this right does not form part of the Scottish Crown Estate following the transfer that took place from the Crown Estate Commissioners last year. 
The bill itself is concerned with the management of Scottish Crown Estate assets and devolving management of those assets to those with an interest in them, such as local authorities and community organisations. While the bill does enable transfer of ownership of assets in the course of management, the bill is not about the question in principle of the Crown's ownership of these assets and whether these assets should form part of the Crown Estate at all. Therefore, the proposed amendment is not actually relevant to the purpose of the bill. It would not be appropriate to require the Scottish <coughs> ministers in the strategic plan, which is concerned with the management of the Crown Estate, to comment on whether the Crown's rights should be extinguished. While this amendment does not directly seek to legislate to extinguish the Crown Estate's property rights and interest in the listed assets, the effect of it is to require the Scottish ministers to consider the desirability of doing so in the strategic management plan, which the bill requires to be prepared every five years. And clearly, any such consideration would have to take account of the fact that it is not within the Scottish Parliament's powers to take forward such legislation. Any attempt by the Scottish Parliament to extinguish the Crown's property rights and interests in Crown estate assets is likely to be outside legislative competence. It would have to take account of the fact that extinguishing the Crown's right in an asset will have a knock-on effect on hereditary revenues generated by that asset, which are reserved even though the revenues are now paid into the Scottish Consolidated Fund. The hereditary revenues are the monies generated from an asset, both that currently raised and also in the future particularly as regards the potential for offshore energy in the Scottish zone, which is that part of the seabed out with the 12-mile limit of territorial waters. More fundamentally, only the seabed out to the 12 nautical mile limit is currently part of Scotland, that is, the territorial waters. The rights in the seabed between 12 and 200 nautical miles are governed by international law, specifically under Part 5 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. The Convention confers certain special rights to the coastal state to this area of the seabed, including exploration and use of marine resources, including energy production from water and wind. The coastal state being the United Kingdom, with recent devolution of the management of these rights to Scotland and Crown Estate Scotland interim management being granted on the basis that they form part of the Scottish Crown Estate. If the Crown's rights in the seabed were extinguished, it is likely that the devolved management of the seabed rights beyond the 12 mile limit, that is, over the zone in which we see great potential for development of renewable energy, would simply revert to the UK government. As for the gold and silver, if the Crown's <coughs> rights were extinguished, then these rights would fall to whoever was the owner of the lands at the time the Royal Mines Act 1424 became law. If the owner's descendants could not be traced, the rights would fall to the Crown anyway, as bona vacantia. The exercise would therefore, in our view, be futile. Uh, so in these circumstances, I ask Andy Whiteman not to press Amendment 37 and uh, not to move consequential amendments 38 and 39. Thank you. And now I invite Andy Whiteman to wind up and press or withdraw his amendments. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and thanks for the comments that members um, have made. Um, just to be clear, Amendment 37 is about um, uh, requiring ministers to set out their views where it comes to aspects such as the Royal Mines Act 1424, for example, um, this amendment of mine was not deemed uh, to be within scope and therefore wasn't uh, tabled for debate, uh, but just for members' information, um, that did, in fact, contain a provision that on such day as the Act is repealed, gold and silver vests in Scottish ministers. It would not be my intention for the Campbells or anybody else um, to get back their gold um, and silver. Uh, with regard to naturally occurring oysters and mussels that the Minister mentioned, I'm well aware that management was transferred um, a couple of years back. They no longer form part of the Crown Estate. Nevertheless, the Crown still has rights in them, notwithstanding the fact that they're not managed as part of the Crown Estate. They're managed by Scottish Ministers. That's no different from other uh, Crown property rights, such as Bona Vacantia, which the, the Minister mentioned that historically have always been, in fact, managed uh, in, 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 in Scotland by the, by the Crown Office. Um, in terms of competence, um, I, I mentioned the section of the Scotland Act uh, in Schedule 5, um, which devolves competence over property rights um, of the Crown. There is a, uh, an issue that could potentially arise over the fact that revenues uh, remain uh, reserved, but in the Civil List Act um, of 1952 or 53, 
the um, assets of the Crown that have never been part of the Crown Estate, that's Bonavacantia, Ultima Aries and Treasure Trove, um, are admitted to be uh, not form part of the uh, civil list settlement at that time because they've never been part of the Crown Estate. And indeed, the Act has now been amended to take account of the devolution of the Crown Estate. And therefore, I don't think there'll be any substantive problem uh, in regard to um, abolishing uh, these uh, rights. Uh, it's worth noting, of course, that we abolished the Crown's rights in the paramount superiority, and the Lord Advocate, um, or the Advocate General, rather, nobody took any um, issue uh, with that. Uh, in light of the comments that members um, have made, in light of the Cabinet Secretary's uh, comments regarding what she regards as Scottish Minister's duties under Section uh, uh, 20 in terms of uh, the scope of the bill, uh, I will not be pressing uh, this um, in debate today. So, Andy Whiteman seeks to withdraw amendment 37. number 37. Does any member object? Amendment 37 is withdrawn. Right. Therefore, the question is that section 20 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that sections 21 to 23 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendment 23 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. The, the question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 24 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 24. The name Thank you. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 26 to 36 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 38. The name of Andy Whiteman already debated with Amendment 37. I invite Andy Whiteman to move or not move. Not move. Not moved. Okay. I call Amendment 39 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 37. I invite Andy Whiteman to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Okay. The question is that Section 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 38 and 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 25 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 44 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 43. I invite Liam MacArthur to move or not move. Not moved. Not moved. Okay. Okay. I call Amendment 27 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 22. Moved. Thank you. The question is that tw Amendment 27 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 26 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. The, amendment is that amen the question is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 41 and 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I to schedule two. I call Amendment 28 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Schedule 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 29 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that sections 44 and 45 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the question is, long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. That ends stage two consideration of the bill. Thank you. Okay. At its next meeting on 25th of September, the committee will take evidence in a round table format on the register of controlled interests in land. And I now close this meeting.